and we pray, and we're praying in the name of Yeshua. For some, it's Jesus. Which Messiah are we actually praying in the name of? Hi, this is Barry Phillips with 10 Minute Torah, day number four. In the Torah portion, Akari Mot, after the death. This is a continuing of this Torah portion from last week. And uh, we're going back to chapter number 17 of the Ikra or Leviticus. And again, it says uh, in verse 7 and 8, and letting them no longer slaughter to the slaughterings of demons after whom they hoard. This is a law forever for them throughout their generations. I say to them, any man of the house of Israel or the strangers who sojourn among you who offers an ascending offering or slaughterings and does not bring it to the door of the tent of appointment, to do it to Yahweh, that man shall be cut off from among his people. Second time that Yah mentions this in this chapter, it appears to me that he's very serious about what he is instructing us to do. I want to build up on what we said yesterday. And again, when we pray in the name of Yeshua, we should make sure that we're praying according to the will and the heart and the character, the work of the authentic Yeshua, who is described for us at the altar pertaining to Levitical sacrifice. When we create a different altar, we have the propensity, the opportunity to create a different Messiah. Let me give you an example. If you will recall the days inside previous systems of worship where we were at, there was oftentimes a call let's all come down to the altar to pray. Now, the altar being referenced was typically what was called a kneeling bench. It was a raised wall or a rail that was uh, built in order for us to have something to kneel and pray against. We would lean on it. We would pray toward it. We would kneel at it. Uh, in modern churches, it was basically the steps at the front that led up to the platform. And uh, that's, you know, it was just considered a praying place. So we would come down front and we would pray. Millions have responded to a call to an altar. And in evangelistic crusades, perhaps, the, the idea is come stand at the altar and offer up a repeat after me style of prayer for salvation. But let's ask the question, what is the purpose of that particular altar? Now, I am not going to sit here and denigrate prayers offered up in such a place because they have been effective. There have been people's lives changed praying at such a location. There is a different way of looking at it, however, and that is what is, again, is the purpose of prayer at that particular altar? Is it a prayer that will authenticate whatever the speaker just offered? The sermon led us to a certain crisis of thought and contemplation. We're invited to come down to the altar and pray about that. <clears throat> was, the, was the message authentic? Was it real? Was it something that was scriptural? Or was it sermon material? And that's about all that there was. So there are times that people have gone to an altar to pray over things just because that's what the speaker asked them to do. Was the message to persuade us or guide us into praying according to a certain thought or a particular vein of, of understanding? Or was it pertaining to a revelation of the Messiah truth, purity of text, and people were convicted by it, by the Ruach of Kodesh, the Holy Spirit then came down and offered up their prayers and petitions because the word was true. Earlier today, when I was praying, I was praying, Father, we have missed the power of your word. We speak your word, we preach about your word, we teach your word, but where is the power and the unction that is attached to your word? We need to learn to speak your word again in power. That is that it has some umph, some conviction, some, some grabbing of the inward man and bringing us to a place of understanding that we need to change. 
So when we slay an alt, uh, an animal and we present that blood somewhere other than the Mishkan, we are bypassing the centrality of what Yah has constructed. We are declaring a different priesthood. We're declaring whatever doctrines that we believe and attachment to that particular sacrifice. So then we have to ask, what is the efficacy of the blood then that has been shed? Not much. When we bow at any altar, <coughs> whether it's in our home, we have a certain place that we pray. Maybe you pray beside the bed, as has been traditional. Or we have a certain kneeling place, standing place, sitting place. Uh, is it maybe praying under tallit? Put in a prayer shawl over your face and your head. Does it make it any more powerful? Is it a tradition? The trust can't be in the prayer cloth, the, pr the tallit. The trust can't be in the position, whether you stand, kneel, or sit. The trust can't be in the location. The trust has to be in Yeshua. So when we pray, we are to acknowledge what Yeshua has done for us. I love this aspect that I, I see, and that is that in heaven or in the heavenlies, at the throne of Yah, it is a timeless place. It is not constricted by uh, time or space. Timelessness, then, means that the blood that Messiah Yeshua presented, and again, he didn't carry his blood and splash it against the altar in the courtyard of an earthly temple. Hebrews allows us to understand he brought his blood into the heavenlies. <coughs> there, that blood is still wet. Time has not had an effect on it in that it's caused the blood to dry up and decay. So the life that is in the blood, as you read about in this chapter, declares to us that the healing, the atoning, the, the delivering power of Yeshua is still wet. It's still life-giving. It's still crying out. As Havel or Abel's blood cried out for justice from the ground, so the blood of Messiah, I believe, cries out in our behalf. So, when we pray, we pray concerning the authentic Messiah who declares that we must walk according to his word and walk in obedience. In the book of Psalms, chapter 66, in uh, verse number 18, the word says, If I have seen wickedness or regarded iniquity, is another translation, in my heart, Yahweh would not hear. If I'm willing to wink at my wickedness, Turn a blind eye to that which is against his word and pretend that it doesn't exist. Yah's not going to listen. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9, one, a verse many of you know. He who turns his ear from hearing the Torah, even his prayer, is an abomination. <laughs> Excuse me. So, to disregard the Torah, to invalidate the Torah, to speak against the Torah, to deny the Torah's ability and place in our lives is to hinder our prayer life. In 1 John chapter number 3, uh, we read in verse number 22, and whatever we ask, we receive for him because we guard his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. If you want to enhance your prayer life, walking in obedience, declaring the authentic Yeshua, the one who has the ability to show compassion on those that are brokenhearted over their sins, but also then to be judging strictly, according to his word, those who refuse to repent. Yah knows how to look on the heart. And we say, well, he knows my heart. And we justify ourselves in saying that. But hear the power and the, the integrity of what you just said. He knows my heart. Oh, Yah, you know my heart. Help me. Because my heart would deceive me and laugh about it if I let it. I must put myself under the scrutiny of the authentic Yeshua 
the finished work of his particular altar and do what is pleasing to him. Then my prayers will be answered. We'll talk again tomorrow. To then, shalom.